Three, two, one. Bam. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Um, I'm in a good mood. I hope y'all are. Christmas is coming, holidays, all that. Of course, there's the uh, there's the bad stuff with it, but uh, yeah, hold on a minute. Right here, Tom. Yeah. So, um, what I'd like to uh, I'd like to fir do first is usually I start out with a prayer. I'm going to end with a prayer uh, on this one. We're doing a wrap up, as you know, of the year. Um, we uh, we just really uh, got a lot of thank yous. We're going to sling out this morning too, but. I thought I'd start with a little Christmas story. Um, it's kind of heartwarming Christmas story. Um, this fellow that traveled all the time, which I can relate to, guys on the road all the time, always traveling, and this year he had traveled an extraordinary amount, so he hadn't been home very much at all. It's getting close to Christmas, and he said, you know, I gotta do something big. I gotta, do, I gotta come up with something big for the family. All this missed time and everything. So it just so happened two of his uh, customers on the route headed back home canceled, so he said, I'm gonna take a different route. Maybe I'll see like a big, huge, crazy tree or something really cool. So he's driving through this little town, and he drives past this little store, and it says, come see Chet the Christmas parrot. He's like, hmm. So he wheels in there, and he says, hey, I'll check this out. So he walks in there, and he goes, hey, how you doing? The fellow says, hey, how you doing? He says, what's the story on Chet the Christmas parrot? And he says, well, you know, uh, actually, he's kind of a local little celebrity here. And he goes, uh, so why are you saying Christmas parrot? He goes, well, Chet's a little unique in that, you know, this time of year, Chet really shines because he's been trained to uh, sing Christmas carols. And he goes, what? And he goes, yeah, you can sing Christmas carols. He goes, that's pretty cool. He goes, well, actually, it's even better than that. The way you get him to sing the carols is with a Christmas candle. So that's kind of his signal. He says, oh, come on. He goes, oh, come back here and check it out. So he goes back there, and sure enough, there's this parrot sitting on a perch. The guy lights a candle, sets the candle to the side over there. Chet looks over there, and he sees the candle. <coughs> Silent night, holy night. The guy's going, oh my gosh, says, that's unbelievable. He says, whoa, whoa, hold on. He moves the candle over to the other side. He looks down and sees it. <clears throat> no, well, no, well. The guy says, that's unbelievable. i got to have the parrot. I said, no, he's kind of a local. Well, sure enough, the guy slung enough money at him. Finally, the guy sold the parrot. This guy calls his wife and says, all right, I'm headed home. I'm going to be home tomorrow. I got an unbelievable surprise for everybody. I want you to get our kids, the neighbor's kids, have them in the living room, have that table up front, kind of clear it off. He says, you know that Christmas candle of yours in the holder? She goes, yeah. He says, just have that ready. She goes, what's going on? He goes, trust me, you're going to love this. So here he comes rolling in. He comes in and he's ready, man. All the kids are in there and he sets it up there, the perch and all that. Gets and he sets the parrot up on the perch and everybody's looking. He goes, I'd like to introduce Chet, the Christmas parrot. They're all going, hmm, huh? all these little kids. He goes, watch this. Of course, he's going to make a big deal out of it. So he says, honey, bring the candle in. She brings the candle in. He lights the candle, sets the candle over there, and Chet looks over. <clears throat> no, well, no. The kid's jaw dropping, flipping out. He's like, yeah, I nailed it. And he goes, well, hold on a minute. And he moves it to the other side. Silent. Oh, big hit, loves it. Wife's hugging him. You knocked it out of the park. He's loving it. He says, all right, let's all go to the kitchen for ice cream and eggnog, yeah. But then he says, hold on kids, I want to talk to you for a second. So his three kids, and so he looks at him and he looks at his little, littlest boy and he says, now listen son, he says, if you want Chet to sing, you're gonna to have to get your brother or sister to do it for you, because you remember, you're not supposed to play with matches. So his brother and sister kind of giving him that look like, yeah, that's right, well, big frown, he ain't liking that. He says, but you can't play with matches, so okay, let's go get some eggnog. So they all go in the kitchen. Well, they're all in there in the kitchen and everything. And, uh, that little boy is not liking it. So he's like most little boys. He says, oh, I'll show them. So he sneaks out, goes down into the living room. He gets the candle. He knows where the matches are. He gets the matches, lights the candle, sticks it up under Chet. Says, okay, I'll make him sing. He's waiting. Parrot's kind of on the perch a little bit, kind of moving around. And he's going, come on, sing. He's moving around a little bit and finally, Chet's nuts roasting on an open fire. <laughs> So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> so, Merry Christmas, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, we got some announcements to make, but uh, more importantly, this is going to be the, uh, the this will be the last of the year, okay, that we're going to do. Um, Chris is right uh, with everything that's going on. We're going to start back on January 5th, okay? So, January 5th is when we start back up. 
I um, also want to make an announcement for uh, uh, Jared. We just, we just made a uh, change over in our operating system. We went to Office 365. And evidently, we've discovered now that some folks are not getting uh, you know, the, uh, the invites. I just talked to somebody this morning that wasn't getting an invite that normally got them. We will have that corrected by January 5th. Jared's on it. That's all I got to say. Once you say that, it's over. So um, also, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, we're not having these webinars, but we're definitely still having the training webinars or anything you want to see. As a matter of fact, we have one next week. We're going to be training some folks in Canada. So if you want any training or anything, that has not stopped. But, the, uh, but as far as these regular quarantine, the webinar series, they will resume on January 5th, okay? But uh, if you want us to train you on anything, please call us, okay? Um, we'll, you know, right there on Christmas week, the end of the week, of course, we're off, but we should be able to fit you in, so please, just don't, don't hesitate on that. That has not ended, okay? Um, let's see here. Uh, make sure I mention everything. Also, we are adding uh, some stuff uh, talking about next year. We are, oh, I should, where's my little, where's the clicker? Oh. So, um, so what we're going to talk about today, we've got an agenda, but uh, you'll see there we got our top 10 takeaways from field testing. And we're going to just talk a little bit about them. We just kind of came up with 10 things, you know, that over the course of this year that, uh, that maybe, you know, uh, we could just highlight and just hit it again, some of the more important things that we've talked about. And then we've talked about what's coming in 2021. Also, though, I, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, we're not sure about other folks. But we really do feel like, uh, you know, you're part of the Powermetrics family. You know, we're, we're very family-oriented. Uh, that goes in that customization stuff. If you want something, you know, we don't just say, well, here it is, or cookie cutter, you know, buy it or don't buy it. We work with folks, and when you work with folks for a while, you become, you know, you, you develop relationships. And I've got some awesome ones out there. I'll just tell you, I'm so fortunate. I feel very blessed for the folks that I've met out there in these six years, and it's, uh, I've definitely got some, some friends that I will, uh, for the rest of my life, they will be my friends, and I'm, and I'm awful proud and lucky to have them. So, um, so we talk about the family and that. So I want to talk about one of them this morning, a uh, fellow down south. I happened to be visiting there a few weeks, and uh, Ray Gore and he had a long discussion this morning. He and Ray are car guys, man, so they were really talking about it. I got to ride in this car, and uh, so I, what I'll do is, first I'll just show, I'll let uh, Jarrett run the video on it, and you'll get to see what I'm talking about. Go ahead. Okay. Um, is there audio on the video? I'll just wait till it's over again. I'm going to walk out here. I'm going to walk out here. So they can't hear me, right? Oh, they can hear me? Oh, okay. That's a bad dude right there is all I'm going to tell you. And uh, I'm not going to spout all the stuff Ray was talking, uh, LS3, what was it, LS, uh, LS3, uh, upper, LS2, lower, all the other stuff. But I will tell you one thing. I think you guys get the idea of what we're talking about here. It will definitely throw you back in the seat. And uh, so... Uh, so it will throw you back in the seat and I didn't send the one where I'm squiggling like a little girl because I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie so I was digging it big time and uh, it is a very 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 beautiful car it, uh, I should have put the picture of the motor in there too for Jarrett but uh, the motor is just uh, anyway you can imagine what's under the hood on that thing so uh, so anyway uh, it's a Camaro I think it's Oh, he's gonna kill me. It's either a, people are all yelling, and car guys are yelling the year. I don't. It's a '67, '68, '69. I know it's in there, and uh, so that's good. Cool. So, um, so that's just one of the part of the Parametrics family, and um, I just really appreciate Mark taking me out in it. It was awesome, and uh, I loved it because, like I said, a little bit of an adrenaline junkie here. So, um, awesome car. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, it's more than just uh, equipment for us. And appreciate these relationships, and uh, I can't thank the folks enough. I mean, if you think about it, we've had a lot of people have been ordering equipment for us just from this, just from, you know, they haven't even gotten a chance to put their hands on the stuff. And that shows some trust in us, and we, uh, we just really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, in these crazy times like this, you know, everybody trying to keep each other up, 
Uh, this is all part of it. It's not just the business part, but it's the encouragement, you know, and the encouragement that we have gotten from you guys on, uh, on doing these has been incredible. And uh, I cannot say enough, I know you've heard me say it before, but these two guys in this room with me you have really done an unbelievable amount of work in, since this thing busted loose. Uh, you guys have no idea how much work they do behind the scenes. So um, definitely uh, thankful for both of those guys as uh, that's been a Christmas present, early one for me having these guys work with me this year because it's, it's really something. And uh, they've kept me from messing up more than I usually do, kind of, sort of. I'm getting grins, but that's fine. So I, uh, but anyway, you guys, uh, seriously, uh, Thank y'all. Appreciate both of y'all. And um, it's, been, uh, it's been something, man. We jumped into this thing. You know, I love the comment Chris made where he said, man, if we had known, we'd have started out one a week because we just didn't know it was going to be going this long. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we jumped in full force because we thought, yeah, well, I got you know, three months of this. We'll just see as many as we can get in three months. Uh, it's been a little longer than that. So uh, anyway, thank y'all so much for the support. Thank you so much for your watching. I know uh, and these guys, I've had to tell them, I get so many calls from folks that don't have a chance to get in the chat room and watch it right now, but they're watching it during their safety meetings. They're watching it while they're at the house. They're watching it, you know, they, they watch it later on. And uh, so, so we know it's getting seen a lot more than we even see on the, on the chat room. So, uh, so we just really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, and once again, uh, we just, I, I think this is just me, John, being a little selfish. I just appreciate it for these guys. They can see uh, how much people appreciate it. And then, of course, you know, the orders that come in, you know, it's, it's just fantastic. So I'm just glad to see these guys get rewarded for all their work. So, um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go through some, we've got a little, uh, got a little list here of top 10 takeaways. Um, I would do the, uh, the Letterman stuff, but uh, Mullins told me nobody remembers Letterman anymore. But I was going to do top 10 takeaways. But we'll just, we'll go with number one. Check the vector diagram before starting the test. Now, I'm sure there's some things you've got sick of hearing me say, and that might be one of them, which is before you start into the test, I very much recommend that once you make your connections and you get everything connected here, this is dead by the way, so that's why I don't have my gloves on before anybody calls me out on it. Um, before you actually start into anything with the test, um, we very much recommend that you go ahead and check. Remember, you can toggle between your primary current and your secondary current. If you happen to have PTs on there, you can also toggle between primary voltage and secondary voltage. But most of the time, people just are, are measuring the primary current with either a high volt probe on the end of an extendo, or they've got their uh, red flexes, or whatever they're using, maybe some clamps. But uh, that is where they're measuring the uh, primary current. So that allows you, then that button becomes enabled because I have a primary current measured, so I can toggle between primary and secondary. Remember, the secondary follows the primary. So we have a problem on that primary current. We don't want to just check the secondary, run a CT ratio test and go, whoop, that's a good one, let's go to the next one. And the problem could be on the primary. So when you're out there, remember to use the check that vector diagram before you start the test, because if you do that, then you'll pick up on any primary issues. You know, a lot of guys have just gotten trained, and I'm the same way. You know, field guys have to be repetitive, and we have to get doing it the same way every time so we don't make any mistakes. And it's just been in my life, it seems that the more possibility for, uh, what would you say? Uh, anyway, let's just cut right to it. The more dangerous the situation, the more you should be that way. Okay, the more that the, uh, the caution that needs to be there. If you get to where you do it repetitively the same way, you tend to make less mistakes. That's why I even get simple with the connect, go left to right or right to left to make your connections on the test switch. Just get in the habit of doing things the same way. And I would get in the habit of looking at the primary stuff first before I go into a test, okay? Number two, uh, identify connections on your test switch. So we've talked about this a lot. You can, you can vet out what's going on at a test switch because we know, and I know this is getting simple, but how many times have you gone out there and someone tells you it's one thing and then you show up out there and it's not what they told you back at the shop when you showed out there to test it? Something, you know, something, a change was made and some, somebody didn't record it, whatever happened. But that's not the same site you thought you were coming up on. So maybe you ought to just make sure you know what's going on at the test switch because that's where you're making all your connections, right? So remember, when we get, when we open up and get that short stroke on that blade, we know that's a shunt blade, right? We know that's a shunt switch that's shunting my CTs, okay? 
See, when I shunt my CTs now, I don't have current going from the CTs, so now it makes it safer to work on this, okay? But also, by doing that now, I'm gonna, if I want to perform a phantom load test, I have to do that because otherwise I'm getting the current from the CTs. So I have to disconnect that or shunt that from the CTs so then I can provide the current if I'm going to do a load, a load box type test, okay? So if I, do a, if I open it and there's a short stroke on it, like if I walked up to this switch and just wanted to see what was what, I know that's shunt blade now, okay? Then when I open this one up, I open that one up and I look at it and I go, wait a minute. Remember, this one's a little bit screwy, and that's why I'm, I'm doing this one on purpose. This is an unusual test switch. So you would think most of the time right beside it, if I open this up, I would expect that. I would expect to open that up, and I expect to see the cross in there, okay, where I can put my duck bill in. There's not one here. So if I have a full swing switch like this, and I don't have a place to put that duck bill in there, that's my voltage. So on this particular test switch, if I'm trying to figure out what's what, that's what I've, I've seen. Okay, that's my shunt. So this has got to be a voltage. Then that would make me look, because this has got an orange handle, I would then come over to here. I would then come over to here and go, ah, there we go. There's my orange with the cross for the duct bill to go in. So I'm identifying here, here, and here. So this is my A phase shunt and A phase return. Okay? So that's so before you get going, if it's something that's, that's throwing you off a little bit, kind of vet it out and see what's what. Okay, so when I look at this, I can see, like I said, okay, if I open that up and it's shunt, and here's my, okay, so it's the same thing. And then this is my voltage, so when I come to here, I go, okay, shunt, return, right? Shunt, return. And here are my voltages, full swing with no cross, full swing with no cross, full swing with no cross. So here are my three voltages. Here's my shunt, return, shunt, return, shunt, return. So then my neutral's right here. Okay, so try and figure out, and remember we've always said this too, these phenolics, you're going to see the phenolics there between the voltages on the test switch. Okay, because they don't want you to cross phase. They want to have something coming across and making contact from phase to phase, right? So they have these phenolic barriers between the voltages right here. So that's another giveaway on this test switch. I'm looking right here and seeing, okay, so that's my voltages got to all be here, right? And they are because I have to give them, I have to have that separation with those phenolics. So I got voltage, voltage, voltage. So I got these phenolic barriers between them, right? Okay, so you can check that out. And I'll go uh, a little bit farther than that here in a minute. And that's actually the, the wiring to it, okay? You can also check the wiring to it because I, I was actually at a, a site once up in the northeast where unfortunately, the, where they were coming in from the CTs, they had them connected incorrectly at the test switch as far as what was coming return versus shunt. Okay, they had where it should have been coming into my shunts coming from the CT, they had those connected at the return. A contractor had done that, okay, and they had several sites, and when I discovered it on the one, then they had to go back and check all the other sites. So they weren't happy, but then it explained why when I had, was on the test kit and my vectors were just bizarro. And I was going, what is going on here? And then it was a visual inspection, and I got looking, and I traced, and I did just this. I said, okay, shunt, return, I should be coming from, uh-oh. And then I noticed the coloring on the wires, and the ones are all the same color, which should have been the returns, were going into the shunts. So that wasn't good. So vet that out, check it out, and look at the test switch. If it doesn't, if it's one you haven't seen before, it's real easy, like we said. Short stroke shunts, long stroke with no cross, voltages, Long stroke with the crosses is my return. Okay? Cool. Number three, verify the service type. Uh, we mentioned this uh, the other day a little bit uh, when we were talking about the, uh, the 5S uh, single phase and the 5S three phase. You know, this, uh, this goes into a little bit of an inspection of the site, too, and that's one of the things I think we're going to talk about here in a little bit is uh, just, you know, Knowing what the service is and everything helps you. I mean, it's critical to you being able to test. But don't just, we said the other day, oh, it's a 5S. It must be, no, 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 especially on a 5S. It could be all kinds of things. Verify the service type because that is absolutely critical to testing with any, anybody's equipment. If you don't have the service type correct on there, you're never going to get it right. I mean, it may give you a false reading that says, oh, yeah, this one tests okay. 
then you get ready and you print the report up and you go, wait, that's not the correct service type there at the bottom of my report. So you got to make sure that the service type matches up with what you select on the test kits that you're using out there because I'm going to tell you, if they don't match up, you will be beating your brains out out there trying to figure out what's going on. And sometimes it can get a little bit squirrely. You know, how many, you want to keep in mind, and this is one of the keys that, that I figured out early on the hard way when I went out there, because remember, I didn't get any training. I was thrown out there. The thing was, I realized, you know, when you're looking at the, uh, the, the PCs on there, how many uh, CTs are actually involved. Is there's one CT, two CTs, three CTs, and there are different service types you can pick on people's test kits that designate that. Whether it's got, and it's, it, with us, we say PC. You'll say, have service type, and you'll have how many voltages, how many currents, and then how many PCs, which is primary currents or which equates to you and I, how many CTs, where are you going to, how many connections you're going to make to measure that service type. And you may see two PCs, you may see three PCs, and that can be a big difference on that service type in not only how you make your connections, how you make the selection, but then also, of course, the readings you're going to get because they're going to be really bizarro and off the charts if you don't connect and, and have the correct service type in that piece of equipment. Okay? There's something important that you want me to say, Mullen, just scream it out. Okay. Probes can be used if no test switch is available. Remember when we went through that webinar where we uh, had pulled out and showed you all the different uh, probes that can be used to verify your, uh, you, can, you can actually do a, a CT test for that. You can go right there and come over on the secondary side where you're coming out of the CTs. Remember when we said, we said you could get on that. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can use these probes. You know, the, the standard probes that we, uh, that we see all the time are on the end of the extendo, the horseshoe or high voltage probe that you use for overhead CTs and for higher uh, primary currents. And then you have the flexes that go around, you know, your uh, conductors and the pad mounts. But then you have a variety of these clamp-ons, okay? And you have clamp-ons that, uh, we have the large clamp-ons, you know, but then we also, for, but it's always dictated by the size of the window, right, on how many conductors you can get in there. But we also have uh, the smaller ones, and we have a variety on them as well. We got those little MN114s. People have these little small ones. Make it very convenient to get into small cans. Okay, so you can go in there and do that. But if there's no test switch available, we can absolutely still test. We have two options there. Actually, you have the probes. We have all those different probes we can use, or you can use a, uh, an adapter. We also have those. But if you just have a set of probes with you, uh, then you, you're good to go if you have the right probes. You don't have to carry around one of those adapters. Okay, you could use our different probes and still test uh, with no test switch. Okay, so if there's no test switch available, you can't use the duck bills, right? So picking up that secondary current, then you're like, uh-oh, what am I going to do? Well, we showed you where we used to use clamp-ons and went right on coming off the secondary off of those CTs, right? And we picked up our secondary current there with the clamp-ons. So that's what kills you when there's no test switch. You can't use those easy-peasy duck bills, okay? No big deal if you have the clamp-ons. If you had some clamp-ons for that secondary current, you could just put clamp-ons on there and grab them. Because remember, you have two probe channels. So you have probe channel for primary and probe channel for secondary. So you have two probe connectors on there, so you can connect a one, one probe adapter cable uh, right here. So you can have one probe adapter cable right here that is connected to the, like on the secondary side, you could have one for the primary. So, um, so you could have two probe adapter cables, one with a set of primary and one with a set of secondary on there. So you could take those secondary ones and just put, come right on the, uh, off of the secondary of those CTs and make those connections there, pick up your secondary current, and you're good to go. Okay. So if you don't have a test switch, as long as you got uh, some clamp-ons, you're still good to go. Okay, so that was something that uh, we had some comments on and people like that, so they didn't realize that. So yes, you can. If you don't have a test switch, you don't have to get a, an adapter and go through all that plugging all that in. You can just use some, uh, some, some small clamp-ons versus having to pull that meter. Okay? So that's really the big difference between the two. Well, you know, having to pull the meter and not having to pull the meter. All right? So you can use those clamp-ons to keep you from having to pull the meter. So far, so good, Mullins? Know where to place the probe during the CT test. Huh. How many calls have Ray and I gotten? And that's when they're out there trying to test and either with a the horseshoe high volt probe on the end of an extendo and they're getting up in the middle of some stuff and they're getting a lot of problems or if they're uh, 
even with their even with flexes, um, when they're up in a pad mount, it's really busy up in there. Remember what we're talking about on that, which is with these uh, with these flexes right here. There's no insulation on the outside of these things, so uh, so that means that when you've got them up in there, and there's all kind of different cables and stuff that are touching on them, or you've got uh, you've got it wrapped around, and you accidentally have have circled in and pulled some control cables, some other stuff in there, as well as the actual conductors you want. It'll cause you problems, okay? Now, and, uh, and also the same thing on with the horseshoe, and I used that example of, and I'll uh, let me flip this over right here. Ooh, that's close. Thank you, sir. And you know we've talked about that before, of a uh, pole gets pretty busy and I've got uh, PTCTs, and it's all vertical, so I've got all these conductors going like this, and I'm supposed to get in there, and I'm supposed to make, with my horseshoe on my extender, I'm supposed to get up in there, and I just want to test just this one right here, but when I wedge it up in there, I'm touching this one, and I'm also touching that one if I cram it in there. The ratio is going to come out okay, right? It's that darn phase angle error. And it, and it still gives you that big old red fail. And you're like, hmm, oh, and I got guys calling me up. And Todd Johnson's calling me from Florida going, dude, what is going on here? So um, I'll never forget the, the call from Todd. So here's what I tell folks is, and remember we've said this before, come out, you can come out here off of your primary, and one of the jumpers off the primary that's coming down here and feeding, you can come right here and get back off away from this stuff, okay? I just want to see the same primary current that that CT seen, okay? Yes, the rule of thumb is to try and get as close as you can to that CT. But you can also test it, and then you'll get good tests, and it is viable, and it will hold up, that you don't have to be right on top of that CT, okay? We like to get right up on it, but if we can't, coming out here is just fine, okay? Because here's the problem. Like I said, if you start wedging in there, you're going to get there's no insulation on the outside of this stuff. So what happens is you're going to get some, some feed from the other things, and it's going to give you a phase angle error. I mean, I went out there before, my ratio was so tight, it was unbelievable. I'm like, sweet, and I still got that big red fail. Like, what is going on? Phase angle error, okay? So I want to try and eliminate that. So if I can, if you need to, get away from that. Same thing we talked about. Let's talk about this real quick. Sir? Oh, darker marker? Sure, man. Oh, darker marker. Okay, uh, how about this? Is that better? Do we have a black one? Oops. Okay. Uh, in my office for sure. There's a black one. So, here we go. So that you can see a little bit better. And uh, if you get in a, uh, we, we said you got your three, you got your three terminals here. And I've got all my conductors coming down here, right? So what I just want to make sure is if I can, to help with that, uh, a lot of times I talk about, you know, so this is A, yeah, that isn't very dark, is it? A, B, and C phases right there. So what I want to do is, is I normally, what I do is I come around here with my flex on A phase, then I try and come up here if I can, around my spade terminal up there for B phase, and then I come down here with C phase if I can and just get some separation between them. Okay, that just helps with that issue uh, to keep them apart. And also remember that you're going to, you don't want to grab any other little cables in there. And it's always that same old thing. You got to check your arrows and make sure your arrow's in the right direction because my current's going this way. So with my current going this way out to the, to the load to the customer, right? I want to have my arrow facing that same way, right? If, so the arrow on there should be facing down, same way. I hear his return. You got that shot. Chunk it, chunk it, chunk it. Oh, you wanted to throw it. All right. Huh? Okay. Is that good? Better? Okay, cool. Okay, so you will want to, like we said, you're going to want to come around here, right, and then here. In case you couldn't see it, and around here. A, B, C. Okay? So, 
That gives us that separation like we said. Also get your arrows correct. So when you first, and this is another thing we've said over and over, always, I always default to John first. So if I get in there and, it, and I get a phase and I get polarity reversal on B phase and I look there and I see that and my, and my vectors are jacked, I'm like, let me make sure I don't have that thing flipped in there the wrong way. The flexes, the, anything that measures that primary current is directional just like the current's directional. Our horseshoes or our high volt probes are, are uh, directional. These uh, red flexes are directional. So we have to keep everything in line with one another. Otherwise, we get that polarity reversal because they're in our opposite directions, right? So you want to make sure, that's what I do. I just kind of keep a separation on these and just make sure you don't capture something else. When it gets real busy, man, you're all up in there and your glove suited up and you're trying to get around stuff, just make sure you don't grab something extra in there, okay? And like I said on the other, if, if I have a pole, Mmm. You better get me a spray bottle or something on. The black's not coming off. So, um, huh? Don't use the black pen. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, can you get my office? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I was going to say, if you, if you get up there and, and, and everything's stacked up, we'll go back to this. So, if everything is stacked up like this, I would just say, if you can, I've done it before where I've turned it some. I've turned that fork and got it in there where it wasn't touching anything. But if not, go over there and grab a jumper. So think about the position of it. Of course, the position also involves the direction of it in, in relation to those, uh, those arrows on, the, uh, on either one. The, the rule on the high volt probes is label towards the load. So I use those two L's, right? Label towards the load. To, to get it in the correct direction up there and orient it correctly up there so you don't get a polarity reversal reading on the test kit, okay? So the position is very important, okay? The position and, and how you put that probe in there, all right? Okay. Number six, ah, customer load versus phantom load. As you know, we're, we're proponents of the customer load, um, but some folks out there want to do the phantom load. Uh, the difference is phantom load just tests the meter. Um, it doesn't take into account the wiring, doesn't take into account CTs or PTs or anything else that's affecting that because you literally disconnect the, the, uh, the meter. Either you disconnect it in the field by opening up the shunts, like I measured earlier, like I mentioned earlier, or you would uh, take, literally pull the meter and go back to the shop and put it in a test board. Okay, but either way, that you're uh, disconnecting it off of the system, so literally you're isolating and only looking at the meter, nothing else. Okay, so when you look at the meter, ah, uh -huh. ooh, nice shot, nice shot. Yep. So uh, now on the customer load, we don't open up those shunts. We leave the shunts closed in because we want to actually use the customer's load. What's going on there, right? So we're proponents of that because especially too, it matters when it comes time for a uh, complaint, right? So uh, I've been out there on the site where they pulled the meter and went to put it, in, put it into one of our test kits and the customer went, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And they said, well, we're gonna test the meter. He goes, no, 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 you stick it back in my socket in the building. I don't know what your magic box is doing. He used those words. Uh, afterwards, it was pretty funny, but um, so, yeah, this way, if you're testing, especially for a customer complaint type thing, now you're, you can say we were there Thursday at 2 o'clock while you were running, and here's what we found when we tested, okay? So, um, looky there. Oh, he's got that thing white as sun. Okay, sweet. Okay, so, um, so we are proponents of the customer load over the phantom load, but obviously we can do both. But remember, the difference is, as we just mentioned in a moment ago, is you're going to open up these shunts Right? You have to open those shunts to take the CTs out of it. And then what, we, what you're going to do is you're going to drive, right? And you'll drive through these duct bills is where we drive the current through the duct bills. And remember, it's always in the white and out the black. All right? When you're reading, that's when you're reading because the current's coming down here, right? The current's coming down on the return. It's returning back, and it goes into the kit and back. When we're driving through them, it's still the same thing. We just say it the other way around. It's out the black and in the white. 
because now we're driving. So we're going to drive out the bottom of that duck bill and then we're going to return back up through the top of the duck bill. Okay? And you also, if you're going to do it at a test switch, if you're going to do a phantom load test at a test switch, that's another thing. It involves you using jumpers. So you're going to have to jumper across because you've now got it opened, right? Because I've opened those shunt blades up for the CTs. So when I open those shunt blades up, I've got an open circuit now. And if I'm trying to drive with the duck bill, I have to drive through that entire current path. And I don't have an entire current path now because my shunts are open. So I have to somehow get across there. And that's when we use the orange and gray jumpers. Our easy hooks is what we use, but there's always, you'll use some kind of a jumper to get across there because you have to because of the current path. Okay, so you're going to have to somehow jump that and get across that opened switch. So we do it with some, some easy hooks, the uh, orange, orange on one end, gray on the other end. You've seen them. So that's how you do the phantom load test in the field. You're going to open these up, but you're going to drive through here so you have to jump or across so that you can make that connection where it's open. Customer load, you just leave everything closed. You use whatever's coming out of those CTs, and then that way. And the other thing is, is there, there can be load shifts. You know, so there's shifting of loads, you know, and, you know, some part of the day. And you guys have experienced this. You've got customers like that. You know, the sawmill runs at certain times, or this mill, or they run the extra shift at whatever, whatever it is. So that time of the test and doing customer load can also see a phantom load test wouldn't take that into account at all, now would it? It has nothing to do with the load. So changing of the loads at a customer, you can't pick that up with a phantom load test because it's just testing the meter. So if you have a customer that's got a lot of changing loads and you want to see what's going on, you wouldn't do a phantom load test because it's not taking into account any of that load. So you could go out there and do a customer load test, you know, one time a day, do a customer load another time of the day, and that's the information that you as a utility can bill them correctly, right? Because it's all about the revenue and us getting the money that we're supposed to get, you know, what we deserve. So if you look at it at different times of the day, you may look and go, whoa, it's, you know, that load has changed so much, we may have to look at, you know, changing our billing on them a little bit. The load gets horrific when everything cranks up. I know if you've been to a sawmill, man, you want to see a power factor go to a sawmill. It ain't good. Not when those big bad boys crank up those big motors to chew up those logs. So um, it'll, uh, you, can, you can have a, a big changes in there, and that may dictate how you build them. So, uh, so the customer load will find that out for you. Phantom load will not. Okay? Ratio versus phase angle error. Mentioned it a minute ago. Ugh. Drives you crazy. Um, when you do the ratio, you know, it, just looking at these, let's draw it up here since Mullen's got me this beautiful clean board now. How's that look? Nice. I got the okay from JP. All right. So, ratio versus phase angle error. I can get a ratio. Uh, re I can get my ratio and it's telling me, man, my ratio is right on the money, but then this phase angle error has jumped up again. So the phase angle error that we talked about before, if you have a phase angle error, so that you guys know, the way that these test kits, everybody's test kits are set up, there's going to be a range. And they've set up a range for where they say, this is now considered uh, either cross phased or this is considered a phase angle error. Okay, uh, and this can be this can be considered just a phase angle error, or this can you know there's three different types of phase angle errors for me in the field. There's just a simple phase angle error, or should I go black all the way? Is that okay? That's cool right there. So I got the phase angle error right here. That's number one problem. Number two problem, polarity reversal. All right, I've actually got polarity reversal. And number three is cross-phasing, right? So there are ranges in there that it's set up. Is that, can you see it or no? The marker's fine, but your hand drive is getting Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas, Jerry. No, anyway, so, yeah, that's true, though. Okay, um, so the phase angle error is just where it's off by whatever parameters, you know, and, and for us, our, so you guys know, because I've had this question asked me, our uh, ratio error, the, what we consider to be the limits of what's pass or fail, is hinged to the phase angle error. So as you change that and widen that, you are widening what is acceptable on the phase angle error. Uh, we're looking at in the future, that's going to be one of the things we're going to change, is we're going to disconnect those two, 
because frankly that phase angle error sometimes can be a little bit too sensitive and I know right now if there were a lot of meter techs watching this right now uh, the heads would be go going up and down very strongly about that sometimes that phase angle error can be awful darn tight okay so we're going to try and separate those so that now you can control each of them separately which I think would be a lot better but right now they are connected with one another so when you as you change that limit on the ratio and what is acceptable and what's pass or fail, you're also changing the phase angle error. Okay? It doesn't change it a lot, but it does change it. So it is widening it as well. But the phase angle error, when it happens, it's a pain in the neck. And you know what I do when I'm looking at my ratios dead on. Okay? So that would be just a simple phase angle error. The polarity reversal, as we know, is when I have my voltage here. How's that, JP? <laughs> so that's my voltage on A phase. And then, and then I would have my current, right? Well, if, if I, for polarity reversal, I know my current. We have a range around 180 degrees between this angle, I'm sorry, between that vector and my current vector, the angle between the two. What's that range, Mullins, that we say is considered, we, we designate as a polarity reversal? That's what I thought. Okay, 140, 200. So anywhere between 140, 140 degrees, and 200 degrees. He's made me paranoid about it. So 140 and 200. Anywhere between there, the machine says that's polarity reversal. So we're talking about, you know, Hundred and sixty makes more sense. Hundred and sixty. Uh, hundred and sixty to two hundred. And so anywhere between there, it's gonna say that's polarity reversal. Because it puts us right over here, right? Right around that 180 degrees. Right? So we designate as polarity reversal for us. And usually for you and I in the field, what does that mean? That someone has wired the, the secondary terminals on that CT backwards. Okay? It can be other things, but that is what, what the first thing that should pop in our minds with this checklist that we've got, this mental checklist. So I'm going to say polarity reversal is in there. Now for cross-phasing, where, where we've actually cross-phased it, though that designation is different. It's, it's going to be a lot higher for it to be out on the cross-phasing. And when, we have, when it falls within those parameters, the machine says, you've got cross-phasing on there. You know what those are, Mullins? Cross-phasing? Oh. 120, 130. I should have told you ahead of time to have the Jeopardy music ready. Okay. So, yeah, so we're looking right because you know that's the number when you're talking cross phasing, right? 120 degrees out. So, around 120 degrees when it's out, so we've got a span around out, then the machine says that's a cross phase. Okay. So, all of these are phase angle error problems. Whereas the ratio is just saying, I just need to compare and say, you tell me it's a 400 to 5. So how close is it to 400 to 5? You told me that CT, you put it, you entered in any equipment and told me that's a 400 to 5 CT. So how close is it to 400 to 5? And then it will give you a percentage ratio error. And the percentage ratio error says, well, this is how close you are to the 400 to 5. You're a one point. 9% off, okay? And you're like, okay, now then that's when your utility company decides, is that pass or fail? Is that, is that good for us or not good for us? And you can designate on the equipment and set it up for, this is my pass or fail for ratio. And when I set that in there, if that falls outside of what I said was pass, then it's going to tell give me a fail. For instance, if I had it set up for 3%, Pass or fail, and that would give me a pass, right? I'm less than the 3% out, so that would give me a pass, okay? If I had 1.5% pass or fail, it would give me a fail. So that's the, it's pretty simple on the ratio. You told me it was 400 to 5. How close is it to 400 to 5? The, the phase angle error can bring into, in more things into account, okay? This one's pretty much how close am I to what you told me it was, okay?
Number eight, delivered versus received power. We, uh, we talked about this uh, on several of them because we got into, uh, when we talked about the solar stuff, didn't we, Chris? We talked about received and that. And, uh, and we talked about the four quadrant stuff and we talked about all that. So um, let's talk about, after I get a swig of water, let's talk about delivered versus received. Delivered versus received power. Pretty simply, what does that mean? As a utility company, I want to deliver power to people and get paid for it. Now, when I'm receiving power, I'm either buying that from someone else. I might be a co-op buying it from someone else. I might be a municipal buying it from someone else. That's received power, that, I'm, that I am receiving the power. I'm not delivering it and getting paid for it. Well, this goes over into, when we're talking about the solar, and we're talking about all the, and the quadrants we talked about before, that's when this really comes into bear because I'm saying, okay, obviously at a solar site, I'm receiving power, right? I'm not delivering power to those solar panels. Those solar panels are delivering power to me. So then that means that would be a received power. Now, going back over to these vectors, we would say, and, and here's where we talked about it. We didn't mean to get all confusing. We didn't even need, mean to spin out on that thing when we got all into the four quadrants and the academia and all that stuff. All we really wanted to point out was the designation that you can see in a class somewhere where they want to do more of an academic of that or from another country even. or It could show different, but we're meter techs. And, I, and I'm talking to meter techs, and I'm also talking to their bosses and their managers and everybody. So what I'm saying is a meter tech that is out there in the field, when he looks and he sees, and we mentioned it before, here's my voltage for A phase. If my current for A phase is in these this side of the diagram, this is going to be received power, right? Because it looks just like polarity reversal, because remember it's 180 degrees out, and in my P brain I can think, I'm supposed to be delivering power to somebody, so even when I'm talking to somebody, man, you're 180 out on that. What does that mean? It's just the opposite of what it should be. Instead of delivering power like I should be day in and day out, now I'm receiving power. So now, Anything on this side with my current, if here's my voltage vector, if my current vector is on this side, that is receiving power. That would mean that I'm receiving power, which looks just the same as polarity reversal, right? So when I look at this, you know, and we, it was kind of half joke, but you know, maybe not. But uh, we said, okay, if you initially looked at it, you go, oh, wait, polarity reversal. And then you look at them and go, yeah, but I'm at a solar farm. <laughs> so probably, it's probably not polarity reversal. It's probably not if they send you out to like they did for me at the, the boys at Grid up there in Massachusetts, sent me to all those solar farms that one day. You know you're going to see this every time because they're all solar farms, okay? Unless they've done something on their side, and we'll throw that one out there, and we mentioned that in the webinars, unless they've programmed their meter and done something to it. Remember, uh, Chris mentioned that when, I, when we were doing one of these. If they've done that, then it might not show up that way. But most of the time, if you go out there and test that, under normal conditions, it's going to give you a negative percentage registration. Because remember, it's the opposite of what I'm looking for. So normally, I want to get a positive registration. I want to get something like 99.9, .9, right? Awesome. But if I get negative 99.9% .9 registration, what's that telling me? It tells me that I am receiving power instead of delivering power. So in that case, if something like this happens, then I do get a negative percent registration. Okay, so if I'm out there at a solar farm, they send me out there, unless I make a change to it, that's what's going to happen to me. And remember, we got into this uh, also when we talked about doing a phantom load test on those sites. You need to set it up so when you go in the phantom load, there is an actual column, and there should be for anyone where you can set it up as received versus delivered. Because if you don't change that, you're going to get a negative percent registration on the test. If you change it, It'll come out to be positive on there, okay? So for people on their reports, how they want to see it, uh, you can change it on the test, or some folks have actually changed it at the meter, okay? But either way, that change will give you that positive registration. But if you and I do it, we need to just keep in mind what's going to happen and know that if I test this under normal circumstances, and like this, I'm going to get a negative uh, percentage registration because it's going to show me as being, if they all were, and make sure I say that all the phases were, then I'm going to get that, okay? So it would look like, if I went to a solar farm, it would look like I would have all three phases polarity reversal. 
or I'm receiving power. So if all three phases have polarity reversal, then that, that would look just like if you went to a solar site or if you uh, go there to solar and you know it's a solar site, then you know it's, I'm just receiving power in all three phases. Okay? So I would either show all three phases look like polarity reversal, which is the same as showing all three phases being received. So it would do the same thing with A, B, and C. See, I'd have A, B, and C, and all of them would be that way. They'd all be out around 180 degrees if I was at a solar site. Okay? And if I don't make those changes, I'll get a negative percentage registration. And then when I get ready to test the CTs, they're going to say, oh, yeah, you got uh, polarity reversal. All right? Cool. Number nine. Four minutes. Okay. Burden measure versus burden add. Um, you know, uh, the burden added has just been around forever. Um, you know, I've, I've told you stories where, uh, you know, I've seen guys that have, have popped and put some, uh, some, they just put some burden or resistance. That's all it is. Burden is just resistance. So they pop and put some resistance on there and then see what happens. But if that's not real world, you know, I, you know in other words, if, uh, if I put, you know, a lot of resistance on there and it tells me, hey, that meter, you, ch you choked off that, uh, excuse me, CT, you choked off that CT now where you don't have any secondary current. Well, that's what's supposed to happen. But if you actually measure the burden, if you can measure the burden in there, then you can find your problems that might not be where it's right on the ragged edge of failing that CT, but it's costing you money every day. Okay, so um, we're a fan of burden measure, and so if you can actually measure the burden in that circuit, then you can make corrections to it. Because you remember, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So if you can't measure it, then you can't correct it, you can't fix it, and you can't make sure that you're not losing money at that site. And number 10. My favorite, use your eyes and your head, right, folks? Those are the best tools you've got. You know, I told my doctor, you can imagine me with a doctor. I told my doctor, I said, the best two tools you've got are right there, brother. Don't get just starting writing scripts and jumping when you hear a buzzword. Listen to what the patient's talking about. You know, listen to what they're saying. They know their body better than you do. Same thing here. Your eyes, your head, who knows those sights better than you do? You're out there. You see them all the time. You can see a change. You can see something's different from the last time you were there. You can notice a problem. You can do an inspection up top and look. Check those transformers out. That's another key, right? You might look and say, wait a minute, that isn't, you know, single phase sight like I, they, they told me when they sent me out here to test it. Whatever it is, and this goes for, you know, uh, we do testing our, ourselves. So if you go out there and you're just sent out there as a job to go test, you know, 300 sites, you're going to run across stuff where it might on a piece of paper say it's one thing, but it's not. So... Use your eyes, you especially use your eyes here, vetting something out right here. Think about it a little bit, and, uh, and then we will, uh, you know, th that's one of the, that is the best tools you got. I mean, especially the more you're out there, and talk to your, your fellow techs out there, and they've got a wealth of knowledge. The guy's been around a long time. If a guy's close to retiring, man, I'd ask him all kinds of questions. Those guys have got more in their head, and uh, so uh, they're some of those valuable tools that these utility companies or these guys have been out there for a long time because they gather and gather this stuff, and it's real-world field information. It's not out of a book. They can tell you, I remember when I was at so-and-so site, and that's a site you're going to be testing here in the next year or two, right? And he's about to leave, so he can tell you about that site, tell you what you're going to see. So, man, grab that knowledge if you can, okay? So, uh, I'll wrap up. Uh, Mullins is cracking the whip on me about the minutes. So, I would say, uh, we uh, obviously, we wish you Merry Christmas. Um, we're in a happy new year because we'll be we won't be seeing you until after the new year um, We uh, we just once again. I can't tell y'all. Uh, thank you enough. Really appreciate it So I'm going to close this out with a uh, with a prayer and uh, We will see you guys January 5th. Okay. All right <clears throat> Father uh, thank you for this year um, we've seen a lot of things happen, but uh, we know that uh, in our walk with you that if we do, it's like Paul said, if these things didn't happen to me, then I couldn't relate to people that were going through troubles themselves. And man, Paul went through way more than you and I do. Whippings, beatings, jails, shipwrecked, I mean, everything he went through. And he said still, though, he welcomed the sufferings uh, the same as Christ so that he could relate to people. And when we go through things and go, uh, Father, we know then that we can relate to other people and talk to them. And we can say, well, we, get, we went through it and, we, and here's, here's what we did in uh and so, Father, and, and the thing that we do is we turn to you and we give it to you. So I lift this country up. 
Uh, thank you for the holidays, and please, Father, to get the Power Metrics family home safe and everyone out there traveling. Uh, hopefully we're not traveling as much this year with everything that's going on, but if we are, please, 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 Father, watch over as people are trying to be careful. And uh, we just, we lift, as I said, we lift this country up, and uh, we lift up the values it was created on, and we hope we uh, maintain that. And more importantly, Father, we just thank you for, what did Paul call it, that indescribable gift that we celebrate the arrival of here shortly, which was your son who died on the cross, and without that, and then rose from the dead. Whew. Um redemption and forgiveness and all those things wouldn't even be possible and so uh he opened up the gates to heaven and we just really appreciate that so thank you so much for him what you did what he did and that's who uh, all these things i say and ask are according to the will of the one who paid it all my brother jesus christ amen thank y'all uh have a great uh christmas great new year be careful and we will see you guys at january 5th with our announcements about what's coming next year thanks again god bless y'all